Where's the best? Welcome back. Another one. Yeah, it's another one. Nah. Anyways, this is going to be a test of extreme high IQ. Come on, you guys saw it coming. All right. If it's not already obvious, this worst to best is of IQ. A brilliant neo prog band that that um, with Marillion started the genre, the genre of neo prog. And yes, script for Jester's Tear and Tales from the Lush Attic were released in the same year. However, I believe that they were recording at the same year, which was 1982. So that's pretty cool. So, IQ and Marillion are the official starters of Neo Prague. So, I'm going to do a ranking of a worst to best of all of their one of the great Neo Prague legends of our time. And yes, I am going to say this I'm pulling a Sea of Tranquility here, and I have nine of ten of their out, nine of twelve of their albums. <laughs> um. And the only ones that I don't have are Seven Stories into 98, because that album is ridiculously hard to find. Um, by the way, I'm going to be touching my screen over here, because I have my list here, right in front of me, and it's on my phone. So, um, The other ones that I do not have are um, Tales from the Lush Attic and The Wake. However, I listened to them all at least twice. Or, and or I'm familiar with all the tracks. So let's kick it off with number 12 on our list. Nam Zammo released in 1987. Yeah, so I'm going to assume that this was not a huge surprise that this was at the very bottom. Um, of course, I have it right here, Nam Zammo. Um, of course you have songs like No Love Lost, which is, I, I love that song, brilliant song. You have Promises, which is the pop song on the album, which is still great, I love that one. And Nam Zamo, the title track, which is the prog song on the album, the, li the lengthy one. I think that reaches about nine, nine and a half minutes. Um, Promises was a very soft rock kind of journey type song that really works. Really cool harmonies, great chords, and the mood is electric. Um, the title track is very interesting um, with a very cool percussion, like bongo opening. And then it leads to this very atmospheric and well-structured piece. But overall, this album is half decent at best there are a few great pieces on this album but overall this album was a huge flop for example songs like um screaming um oh god screaming uh <laughs> um and passing strangers not great none of those were great there was only about three songs on this album that were really that were that were good to great and then the rest of them were mediocre to pretty bad at, 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 at least. So, number 11. Seven Stories into 98, released in 1998. Okay, so I don't have that album in physical, but I have listened to it, and I know that this is supposed to be a re-recording of Seven Stories into 8, from 1990, no, 1982, and, uh, okay, to be perfectly honest, I found that it was very amateurish, the demos were very amateurish, the ones that they decided to re-record were not very good, um, I can live without this, if they, did, if they decided to just leave the demos as they were, I would have, I wouldn't have cared, the songs on this album were all, they were all mediocre. They were all okay. Uh, but nothing stood out to me at all. There was no interesting chord progressions. There was no staggering atmospheres. Everything was bland. There was, the structure on this album was a huge mess. And frankly, this album was not fun to listen to at all. Um, I really cannot say much about this album, unfortunately. So, um, number 10.
The Seventh House, released in 2000. Okay, this is where the IQ albums get great. This album, from end to, from end to finish, is great. Um, cool songs, good epics, great atmosphere, and it shows where the band is going from here. This is the album where, um, you know, they were taking a more heavy approach. Is this album stellar? No, it's not stellar. But it has a lot of tracks by the band that I would consider staple tracks. And a lot of people would consider them staple tracks as well, such as The Seventh House. They do play this song a lot on tour. Which, honestly, is a great epic about a war veteran. Um, the, oh, <laughs> the album was a bit hard to get through at times. It did seem like very stereotypical IQ, but it's still a great album nonetheless. So, um... <laughs> Number nine. The Wake, released in 1986. Whew, I do not have this one on uh, on physical, sadly, and I really want it because holy crap, is this one great? Um, Outer Limits, The Wake. Good lord, I'm having an IQ gasm. <laughs> um, these tracks are. Both brilliant. Great chord structure. Amazing. Atmospheric. It's just, it's great. The vocals are amazing. Peter Nichols did a really good job on this album, and I'll commend him for that. Um, every song on this album has a different mood. This album does lack a solid epic, or an epic at all, but it still grasps what's good about Tales from the Lush Attic. Number eight. Tales from the Lush Attic, released in 1985. Oh boy. Wow. Oh, <laughs> had to get that. Um, every song on this album is great. And again, an album that I don't have on physical, which is sad, but what can you do? Um, The Last Human Gateway. Superb epic by the band, and easily one of their best epics. Easily. Um, the song, um, is just, it's very early Genesis, and the remix opens the sound of the album a lot. It just makes it sound fresh. The epic on its own has a great structure, well put together, great chord progressions, great atmosphere, and frankly, everyone plays really well. Um, it's a very classic neo prog album because it's 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 one of the founding albums that founded neo prog. Um, this album also has some of Martin Orford's best work. Um, I would, um, for example, "My Baby Treats Me Right" because I'm a hard love man all night long. <laughs> God damn it, that is a long title to say. <laughs> He does really well on this, and this really shows his actual skill, but he never does anything like this on IQ ever again, which is really sad, and I wish he did more of that kind of thing. It would have made him a more prominent keyboard player, and he would have been known as one of the greater ones, instead of him being known as a very good one, but never been one that stood out from the crowd. Um... This album really solidified the band's sound from the very beginning. Uh, <laughs> the biggest problems with this album is that it's it's messy. It's a messy album from beginning to fi from beginning to end, and the drumming is all over the place. And as a drummer, it takes away from the album. If your drumming is all over the place and you can't figure out what you're doing, it'll make the album seem messy. But Paul Cook, you are one of my favorite drummers. Now, because you have more experience than you did back then, so congratulations for for becoming a very mm, unoriginal and very bland drummer who was messy to being a great, solid drummer in prog. Thank you for that. Number seven. <laughs> Subterranean, released in 1997. Okay, this album, this album is a masterpiece. 
It's a masterpiece of a concept album. And holy is this a powerful album. <laughs> this album even got a movie, if you can even believe that. And if that doesn't tell you right off the bat how awesome this album is, then you might need to stick around to hear the end of this explanation. <laughs> the atmosphere on this album is absolutely phenomenal. It's electric and immersive from beginning to end, just brilliant. Of course, it has a problem where it ends... Um, it, it does rip from the concept of the lamb a bit, but it's still great. It's a staple album from the band for sure. Number six. <laughs> Frequency released in 2009. Okay, this was an interesting one for me. <laughs> this is an interesting one for me. Um, Frequency is quite the album. Of course, it suffers from the typical IQ syndrome, but it has some amazing moments and some great progressions. Um, of course, the song Life Support on this album, it's... It starts off with a very nice, calming intro, very much like a, you know, a, a, a typical IQ song. But then it goes into this Please Don't Touch era Steve Hackett kind of thing, and I love it. If they stuck to that kind of thing more, they would have been, a, they would have been an even better band than they are now. Um, and, and it's sad to say that they don't do that very often, and I wish they did. It would, it would make them a better band. It really would. Because it introduces a new progressive element that they don't use often, and it and it's and that's the sad thing about the, you know, I would love it if they stuck to that. Riker Skies, whoo, that's a brilliant piece with a bunch of really intricate progressions, structures, changes, uh, structure changes, <laughs> um, interesting lyrics, and it's just and it's just a warped idea that is just IQ heaven. I really, really love this album, and I give it high marks. Province. Wait. Yeah, the province, closer, one fatal mistake, stronger than friction, frequency. Everything on this album is great. I love it. I love that album. I love it. And that artwork is pretty cool, too. Not gonna lie. Not gonna sit here and lie to you. Okay, number five. <laughs> Ever, released in 1993. Okay, this is one of those albums that um, if people were, if I were to ask someone what they would consider a staple IQ album that solidified their sound and, may, and you know, it still holds up to this day as a great album, they would say Ever. And I would have to agree with them. This album is amazing. It is a complete album and it's just a beautiful work by the band everyone was really putting an effort on this album and everyone was working together it was obvious that they were trying to put together a, be a beautiful album and it's it's a beautiful album for sure um martin peter mike john and paul everyone was working together to make this album brilliant and what they have here is brilliant there's so many amazing things about this album. The songwriting craftsmanship, the chords, the structure, and the atmosphere of this album is just gratifying. The Darkest Hour, it's just brilliant. And I'm going to I'm going to do a full-length review on this album based on my review from Prague Archives. And if you haven't seen it, go look in, uh, in the description. It'll be there. And uh, tell me what you say. Let me know what you think of that, too, because um, I'm going to be basing my review on Ever off of it because, well, that's how it is. Number four. All the days when Resistance, released in 2019. Okay, so this album is definitely a grower. It took me a while to get used to the more metal approach on this album. This album is about as heavy as the Road of Bones, but it has tracks that really suffer. Like, Stay Down. It just, it started great. That song started great. It was nice and quiet. And then it went to this unbelievably unnecessary heavy bit that just completely ruined the song. 
and it was just completely unneeded. Um, but I think that the biggest disappointment on uh, on Resistance was uh, the Great Spirit Way. Yeah, every I don't I I understand why some people would like it, but I definitely do not. It. <sighs> I had high expectations for that song too. I was listening through and I was just like, man, this song it has to be good. It's 22 minutes long. And honestly, it's probably the band's worst epic. I hate to say it, but it's probably their worst epic. It's there there's absolutely no solid melodies. There's no structure. It changes every 30 seconds. And seriously, the the best parts about it are the first four minutes and then the last four minutes. Everything in between is just a huge mess. There's nothing that I can just sit down and be like, yeah, that's pretty good. No, uh, the middle section from the first that begins at the first four minutes and then the and then ends at the last four minutes. It's a mess. There's nothing that I can listen to on that song that's just like, hey, that's pretty good. No, it was a huge mess. It was the biggest mess that I've ever heard out of an epic, and it's probably one of my least favorite epics. It's still a semi-decent track. It's subpar, but it really is a weak song. It's probably one of IQ's weakest songs that I've ever heard them write. Alan Pandrea. It's a cool throwback to Dark Matter, but it has an unnecessarily long intro that comes... It's a reprise of uh, A Missile, which is cool. Um, but I think that the best thing about the intro to Alan Pandria is um, the haunting... Um, <coughs> voice crack. Um, is the haunting Mellotron chords by Mr. Um, Neil Durant. And... Again, voice crack. What the hell's happening to me? <laughs> Either way, it was a really cool throwback, and I liked it. Um, but oddly enough, the um, the best songs on this album were everything else. Um, a missile being a very heavy opener, just mm, I grabbed the magic that I really loved from uh, the Road of Bones. Um, Rise has a uh, it's really good too. Um, nice soft opening, and then it goes to a really heavy, very righteously and a oh, well deserved heavy part with heavy part, heavy part with really, really well done, uh, with a really well done drum beat. Again, Paul Cook, amazing. Love everything that you did. Um, uh, my personal favorite tracks on this album were Shallow Bay. If anything, yes, if anything, yes, I know. Everyone hates that track, but I love it. It's everything that I think IQ can do that is... They do that perfect. They do that stuff really well. They do that 80s Genesis sound really well. Um, um, for Another Lifetime, the first epic on the album. I loved it. It was brilliant. I loved that track to bits. And it's probably in my top five favorite epics that they've ever recorded fire and security perfect space those ones are also amazing great chord progressions amazing atmosphere you get the drill um and easily a top three or five epic fallout 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 i love it it's brilliant there's absolutely nothing bad about those those tracks at all everything from a missile Rise, then to Shallow Bay, to um, for another lifetime, then from Fire and Security to Fallout. Those are all all amazing songs. All the other ones I could live without. Alan Pandry I could probably live with on the album, but the um, Stay Down and the Great Spirit Way I could I could I would cut those ones out and then I would make the album a single disker. But I do have to say. Look at the beautiful... Oh, man. It's beautiful. It's, a, it's beautiful. This is easily their best their best packaging. It's beautiful. So, I will give them credit. I'll, I'll give them credit for um, making it a double album just because it's it wouldn't feel as good if it was a single disker. Those 
great songs on the album really do show that this is the spiritual successor to The Road of Bones. So, number three. Are You Sitting Comfortably, released in 1989. Okay, I'm going to get huge flack for this. And I know. Yes, I put it in the top three. Why? Because it's a prog album through and through. I'm looking you right in the eyes and I'm telling you this with a dead, serious expression. This album right here is just as prog, if not more prog, than Subterranea, The Seventh House. And that's my idea. Nostalgia is Please Don't Touch by Steve Hackett Reimagined. It really is. Falling Apart at the Seams is just a stellar track. <laughs> um, Sold On You was the attempt at writing a proggy hit, and it was still a great song for sure. Um, Through My Fingers is a very camelous track, and I enjoy it a lot. Uh, Wernish? Uh, Wernish? Wernish? I don't know. It's just a... It's just a... It's just, that song is dripping with brilliance. It's the longest song on the album, coming in at 9 minutes and 30 seconds. It It's a very developed song with a very Genesis sound. It has a bite that sticks with you, and it's more emo and it's it's just more emotional than the title track of Nom's Ammo. So um it's kinda like that too, so you know. It it works better. And of course it's produced by Terry Brown. Come on. Terry Brown production. Come on. The man who produced Rush for goddamn sake. If they if he did Rush, he can do IQ just as well. And he did. So Terry Brown, if you're watching this, which I completely doubt, thank you. For producing Are You Sitting Comfortably, it's a top three IQ album of all time. Thank you. Um, nothing at all. The emotional end to this album that still gives me goosebumps. Whew. Um, um, it's, it's brilliant. It's a great way to end the album. Why this album is so poorly rated, I will never understand. Um... <laughs> People are just blind. People are blind by this album. And and yeah, I understand that there are some people who don't like it. And it's not their favorite. But at least some of them like it. There's a lot of hate for this album that I do not understand. It's probably one of their most prog albums that they've ever recorded. I don't know. They just can't see past the Paul Mental albums. By they just can't see the Paul Mental albums without hearing the pop albums, and they they just skip the prog stuff on this album. Completely forget about that about the prog elements on this album, and then they write it off as a shitty pop album. When in reality, there's more prog on that album than there is pop. There's one pop song, and then then the rest of it's all prog. It's a shame that people can't see that. That are you sitting comfortably? It's a progressive rock album. It's sad that people can't see it. Anyways, number two. Dark Matter released in 2004. Oh, this is the album that got me into the band. I mean, look at it. Beautiful through and through. However, it does say that it was released under Inside Out. Which is strange because on Wikipedia it says it was released under Giant Electric P, which Giant Electric P is uh, Michael Holmes' record company. If that wasn't already obvious, <laughs> um, I don't know. Maybe that's a maybe that's a, a stupidity on Wikipedia's fault. But it is the album that got me into IQ in the first place. From beginning to end, it's perfect. The biggest problem with this album, on on the other hand, is that. Um, the production is not great. It's very muddy. It's not really well recorded, and the obviously and the very obvious political lyrics that just don't work too well for me. But anyways, Sacred Sound, brilliant opener. I've always loved it. The middle section with the church organs is just, uh, just gives me goosebumps every time. Um, Red Dust Shadow is a very acoustic song that changes to a very staple IQ sounding track. 
You Never Will is a brilliant, typical IQ track. Even though it has the stereotypical IQ sound, it definitely is uh, one of the better... It's on the better end of the stereo, um, typical IQ sound, sounding songs. Born Brilliant is just an atmospheric piece uh, and that engulfs you the second that you hear it. That's for damn sure. And uh, it's just... Mm, love it. And, of course, The Epic, which is a top three track by the band for me. Ever. Pun intended. Um, Harvest of Souls. The acoustic opening, it's just perfect. It leads to this grand scale epic that just leaves you with a perfect climax. That is why this is not number one. <laughs> the mix and the lyrics. Very obviously politically driven, and I'm not a fan of that. But still a great album nonetheless. So... Without further ado, let's introduce number one. What the Road of Bones, released in 2014. It's no surprise that this album deserves the top spot. It has everything I love about Dark Matter, but they did it better. I mean, the artwork is better, the tracks are better. This is the... A single disc version, but still. Um, this album, oh man, it's just brilliant. From the outside in, just a powerhouse of an opening track. The title track, from beginning, oh, it's just being, it's everything that it needs to be. An atmospheric piece that just sucks you in. Without walls. Their best epic by a landslide. Um, the opening has a very 80s Genesis feel with that um, drum machine track and the drum track, which is nice and calm and soft and uplifting. It's just a beautiful thing. Very Tony Banks. Um, then it goes down to this dark and menacing path. And it's just perfection. It has a very messy bit near the end that resembles the Flower Kings, which I'm not still sorry i'm sniffling a lot and i'm sorry i'm on the mic <laughs> oh, the guitar work and everything on this album just on that song just fits so well the keyboard solos aren't amazing but iq has never been known for having brilliant keyboard players um ocean is a very touching and emotional piece and then we end off with Until the End. Which, if I even need to explain why it's the perfect end to this album, you need to go and hear it again. Go and listen to it again. <sighs> the bonus disc that um, apparently counts, that people will count as the full album, which I have coming in the mail, I have the double disc coming in the mail, and I'm going to say this, I count the second disc because... It, it, it really is counted as a double disker when you really look into it and even Michael Holmes has stated that it should have been a double disker so I'm counting it as a double disker <laughs> um it's just it's it's amazing too knucklehead overture 1312 constellations fallen rise 10 million demons and hardcore all are amazing tracks that should have been on the official release uh, I don't want to go on and on because I'm going to do a full-length review on all of these five in my top five. But this is my number one. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please leave a like, share, and subscribe. If you in, if would, Let me know what you thought on my list. Show me your list in the comment section below. And hey, next is yes. So get ready, because that is the next one. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, peace.